For those who don't know me, I'm Jeannie. I'm one of the senior research fellow at the Gibbs Lab in the System Biology Division and also a medical oncologist at Peter McCallum and Western Health. So our work in circulating tumour DNA really began in 2010, where Bert Vogelstein presented uh, some of their initial work and his technology at that time was beaming, digital PCR technology in CT DNA detection in one of the Ludwig uh, meeting in Baltimore. And Peter Gibbs, our uh, lab head, attended that meeting and they began a conversation on how we can bring this very promising novel test into the clinic. So since then, over the last six to seven years, that you know, was the beginning of a very successful trans-Pacific um, collaboration between the two groups, where now we have over 10 clinical studies, all based on circulating tumor DNA as the biomarker, um, to look at the different clinical applications of this test in colorectal cancer, utilizing the expertise of clinician researchers in, in across Australia, the participation of um, now over 20 Australian hospitals with well annotated, uh, annotated clinical data and samples, including tumour and blood samples, um, and the scientific expertise of the Bogelstein lab who does all the molecular analysis for our clinical samples. So now we are, we've actually initiated a randomised trial looking at the utility of this test and there will be three other randomised trials um, to be open in the next three to six months. So bowel cancer, for those who don't know, is an important um, problem. It is the second most common cause of cancer death in Victoria and Australia, with about 4,000 deaths in Australia per year caused by this disease. Um, the risk of and an average um, Australian population um, being diagnosed with bowel cancer by the age of 85 is one in 10 for men and one in 15 for women. And the risk of dying from bowel cancer by the age of 85 in the average population is one in, four, one in 46. So it is a big um, problem. Um, just want to go through a little bit of background of bowel cancer and how we manage bowel pan cancer before I launch into talking about CTDNA and its application. So generally speaking, bowel cancer can be divided into um, four stages. Um, broadly speaking, stage one to three are cancers which are confined to the bowel wall and the regional lymph node and therefore potentially curable with surgery and or chemotherapy. Stage four cancers are cancer that has spread to distant organs or distant lymph glands, which are generally not curable. Um, so the poor prognosis of stage four or metastatic disease is reflected by their low five-year survival as compared to the early stage disease, stage one to three. Um, so generally speaking, about half of patients with metastatic disease present with de novo um, macroscopic disease that can be detected um, on CT scan as metastasis in the liver or lung, for example, whereas the, the other 50%, the other half, um, initially present with localised disease and then late, later on recurred um, down the track during surveillance. So in theory, um, there are two ways to reduce uh, mortality from bowel cancer or morbidity from bowel cancer. One is through early detection screening, we're hoping that we'll do a stage migration, detecting cancer early, and therefore more patients will be cured. And the other method of, um, and other way of reducing cancer mortality would be to improve the cure rate of early stage disease by using means such as chemotherapy after surgery to wipe out or eradicate any micrometastatic disease. So early stage cancers, patient with no visible metastatic disease seen on what we call the staging CT scan before surgery. They then are managed with curative surgery, plus or minus adjuvant chemotherapy, depending on their risk of recurrence to eradicate any residual cancer cells. Radiation is used only in patients with locally advanced rectal cancer. 
Once all these definitive treatment are done, patients are then um, having a, uh, they go on to what we call a surveillance program of five years of monitoring with regular three to six months uh, clinical visits with blood tests and annual CT scans. Metastatic disease, on the other hand, are really, really curable. There is a small group of patients, it's about 10%, with oligometastatic disease where they present with very few metastatic disease, such as this um, patient there where, with one liver lesion was potentially resectable, and these patients still have probably about 40 to 50 chance of cure um, after the resection. However, the majority of patients with metastatic disease, the other 90%, present with incurable widespread disease where our treatment intent is palliative um, using systemic treatment uh, to make sure the patient lives as long as possible, but also as well as possible, so not exposing them to additional too much toxic treatment. So systemic treatment currently, broadly speaking, involves cytotoxic chemotherapy and biological tar targeted therapy. Local treatments such as radiation or surgery are mainly used uh, to palliate any local symptoms. So moving on now to talk about circling tumor DNA. Uh, most of you will know this concept, so I'll just briefly uh, introduce it. So all cells, including tumor cells and non-malignant cells, share DNA, so-called cell-free DNA, into the bloodstream. So circling tumor DNA, there are small cell-free DNA fragments that are shared from tumor cells into the circulatory system. Now, the mechanism by which these tumor cells are released into the bloodstream are not very well understood, but it's thought to be um, from cancer death through the process of necrosis or apoptosis. Once in the bloodstream, the ctDNA only persists for a short period of time with the estimated half-life of about two, two hours. So the advantage of using this tumor-derived DNA as a biomarker is the exquisite specificity. So every cell within the cancer has a core group of mutation in their driver genes that promotes growth. So these can be either somatic mutations or chromosomal translocation or even methylated DNA, so which can be used to distinguish tumor-derived DNA from normal DNA. And luckily for colorectal cancer, the, whole can um, the Cancer Genome Atlas Network has and define 17 somatic recurrent mutated genes, which can be used to distinguish tumor-derived DNA from normal circulating DNA. However, the biggest technical challenge in ctDNA detection for those who, who work in this field, um, um, particularly in solid tumor, is the rarity of the tumor DNA amongst the several thousand uh, genome equivalents of normal DNA that's released by your bone marrow, skin, uh, or GI tract that's present in about a mill of circulating plasma. Therefore, the detection technology for ctDNA must be highly sensitive, and traditional sequencing of a mixture of 10,000 DNA template molecule, only one of which is uh, a mutant, would not be able to um, detect this weak signal. But diluting the molecules and distributing them in multiple reaction would produce uh, thousands of wild-type signals and one clear mutant, i.e. a digital and absolutely quantitative, quantitative result. So this is the basis of digital PCR, a technique that was first developed by Bert Vogelstein and Kenneth Kinsler from, from um, the Hopkins in 1999. So after sample partitioning, and the, the more you partition, the better, um, and PCR amplification of each individual compartment, the Poisson statistic can then convert the count of positive signal into absolute numbers. So currently beaming, which is a water and oil emulsion te uh, technique, and droplet-based digital PCR, the two primary methods of digital PCR that's... Um, that's um, been in use and also commercialized. So that said, digital PCR has its limitations. While it offers a high sensitivity and specificity and a relatively quick turnaround time, they're limited by the number of uh, mutation that can be queried or probed at the same time. So massive, massively parallel sequencing, or NGS, 
is in fact a very powerful form of digital PCR in that hundreds of millions of DNA template can be um, analyzed uh, one, one by one. And it has the advantage over conventional digital PCR method in that multiple bases can be queried sequentially and easily in an automatic fashion. Now, one of the trouble, though, is with that's inherent to NGS is the high error rate that is produced um, uh, without any modification, which may limit its uh, application in certain clinical setting that requires a very uh, sensitive um, method, uh, such as uh, de early detection screening and detecting uh, minimal residual disease. However, several novel adaptation of uh, massively parallel sequencing has been developed that takes advantage of the benefit of NGS while retaining the sensitivity of digital PCR. So one such technique is the safe sequencing system that's been developed by um, Isaac Kindy. Uh, he was a MD PhD student at uh, Bert Vogelstein's lab, so I published this in 2011. So this technique basically uses molecular bar barcoding. So in the unique ID assignment step, individual DNA template is tagged with a unique molecular barcode. The amplification step then creates unique ID families, each member of which has the same unique ID. If a mutation is pre-existing, all members of the unique ID family should have that mutation. If a mutation is artifactual from sequencing or amplification error, only some members of the unique ID family will have this mutation. So this method allows mutation detection on average down to 0.01% level. So all the studies that we, we are currently doing collaboration Bird's Lab uses a safe sequencing system as the CTDNA detection assay. Um, so in 2014, um, um, sort of work uh, coming out of Bert Wolfstein's group in, in collaboration with many other clinical groups, including ours, um, published um, this study in Science Translation and Medicine where they genotyped 640 patients with various tumor types, as well as analyzed their pla patient's plasma with a combination of beaming and cef and PCR ligation technology um, to uh, for point mutations or gene rearrangements. What they found that so in metastatic disease, majority of patients, about 82% of patients with solid tumor, have uh, de ctDNA detected in the peripheral blood, except for brain tumor for obvious reasons. <coughs> and what is interesting also is that um, ctDNA could be detected in localized non-metastatic disease in about 55% of localized cancer, although the fraction obviously is lower than the metastatic disease. So one of the driving force behind accessing genetic information from the blood, apart from the ease of obtaining blood samples, is the phenomenon of tumoral molecular gen uh, heterogeneity, particularly after exposure to targeted therapy, which can result in selective growth of subclonal cell populations. Therefore, a single lesion biopsy, particularly at a time of progression, may underrepresent the molecular heterogeneity of resistant tumor clones in an individual patient and fail to detect important resistant mechanisms that may affect subsequent treatment. In theory, accessing cancer genetic information in the patient's blood could provide a more complete picture of the patient's um, cancer and can be followed over time easily. So the issue of different metastatic lesion producing uh, different genetic um, a mechanism of resistance to target therapy was very elegantly demonstrated by work by Rousseau et al., which is a collaboration between the Harvard group and Italian group, where they analyzed serial tumor biopsy as well as serial circulating tumor DNA in a patient with metastatic colorectal cancer who was initially treated with the anti-EGFR therapy, cetuximab. Shown here are the treatment time course, the CEA results, as well as the mutation data or sequencing data of four tumor samples that was taken um, over time. I just want to highlight particularly a new MEC1 mutation that was circled there. Um, that appeared on, um, in, in a liver lesion that was progressing 
um, after prolonged treatment with um, cetuximab and RNTCAN, note that this mutation was not present previously in other tumor samples that was analyzed, only appeared after cetuximab treatment. And contrast, the, the P53, P53 uh, truncal mutation was present throughout uh, the patient's clinical course and throughout his samples. Um, they then analyzed serial circling tumor DNA um, for various mutations during um, uh, treatment with apenitumumab and trametinib. Trametinib is a MEK inhib inhibitor, and that was commenced after the MEK uh, mutation was detected in the patient's liver lesion. Um, as you've seen here in the top panel, uh, the CEA and P53 results, which initially responded, dropped, but um, subsequently increased. When you look at the MEK1, which is the um, bottom um, graph there, um, that mutation level in the blood is persistently low throughout the treatment. And that correspond to a shrinking liver lesion where the mutation was found. However, they also found a um, increasing level in a new unrecognized KRAS mutation in the patient's blood, which was subsequently found in a separate liver lesion um, that was growing um, during this treatment. So this body of um, evidence suggests, really highlights the fact that ctDNA um, should be integrated into um, um, the patient's management um, strategy. So I had to just have a brief a dis a discussion about tumor genotyping and potential use of ctDNA as a molecular mechanism of resistance. Another potential use in a metastatic setting of ctDNA would be as an early marker or early signal of treatment response and um, treatment failure. There's little doubt that there has been significant progress made in the treatment for metastatic colorectal cancer over the last 15 to 20 years with the availability of multiple new cytotoxic as well as targeted therapy, where patient survival has now been extended to 30 months from uh, about 6 to 12 months previously. Um, however, in routine practice and clinical practice, not all patients, in fact, probably less than half the patients are exposed to all active treatment options that's available in the clinic. Um, so this reverse pyramid demonstrates the uh, number of patient attrition as they go through subsequent line of therapy. And um, you see that only 28% of patients eventually get onto about third line chemotherapy or has the opportunity to trial novel um, experimental treatment. And we believe that one of the contributing factors to the patient attrition is the limitation of the way we assess disease status currently in metastatic disease, particularly during treatment. So in the clinic currently, no matter where you go in the world, gold standard for assessing disease response, disease status is still CT scan, plus or minus PET or MRI scan, but really CT is the gold standard. Now CT scan is an anatomical assessment of patients. Um, disease. It does not measure size, but not the uh, number of viable tumor. And, and there's also a tricky situation where patients often have bony metastases or, or ascites or peritoneal disease um, in the lining of their bowel, which is not easily measurable and, or comparable during treatment. So potentially circling tumor DNA, DNA which measures the, um, the more accurately the disease burden and has a very short half-life of two hours, could potentially be a um, more accurate and early uh, signal of disease um, or treatment um, response or failure. So the benefit of um, the ability to detect um, treatment response or failure is so that we can switch a patient to alternative, potentially more effective therapy and spare them from potentially toxic, ineffective and expensive treatment. So the key questions we asked was in the study that we did several years ago in a small group of patients with metastatic disease is, does ctDNA level change and how quickly does it change following treatment with um, chemotherapy? And can early changes in ctDNA predict for treatment response? 
So we enrolled 53 patients with metastatic colorectal cancer who was treatment naive. So they, these patients have never been treated with any treatment in the metastatic setting and is planned to undergo first-line combination chemotherapy plus or minus biologics. Patients' tumor tissue were analyzed um, for mutation in, in 15 genes, uh, which is currently mutated in bowel cancer. And serial blood samples were collected um, at baseline before they start treatment, day three after starting treatment, and two to three weeks after they've started treatment prior to second cycle of chemotherapy. And these blood tests were analyzed for CCDNA as well as CEA, and all patients underwent a restaging CT scan at week eight to 10 um, after they've commenced treatment, and the scans were then assessed by a radiologist centrally um, for response. So of these 53 patients, 52 of them had a mutation detected, at least one mutation detected in the tissue. And of these 52, 92% or 48 out of 52 uh, had a matching tumor DNA detected in the patient's plasma at the time, um, just prior to starting their chemotherapy. Um, the median uh, proportion of CT DNA in the patient's sample was 16%, it's quite high, um, which is not surprising given these patients usually have quite a high burden of disease. So then we look at the changes of CTDNA and CEA after one cycle of chemotherapy, shown here. So dot plot, so to the left is your CTDNA. Um, you see that CTDNA, uh, the large drops quite significantly, um, between baseline and two weeks after, before starting cycle two, but didn't really drop three days after starting chemotherapy. On the other hand, CEA barely moved at all um, during the first cycle of treatment. And that's because CEA has a, a long half-life of about seven days, as opposed to two hours um, for CTDNA. Then we looked at the predictive value of um, full reduction in CTDNA in predicting um, early tumor response at their first restaging CT scans, you see that there is an association, a strong association between a early drop in sort of, we use tenfold as a cutoff, uh, a more than tenfold drop of CTDNA as early as after one cycle of chemotherapy, predict for an early response. So a 74 patient who had more than tenfold drop in their CTDNA had a response seen whereas only 35 of those who, who has less than 10 for reduction had early, early tumor response seen. And this uh, translates into a trend, not significant, but certainly a trend towards a better control of disease, um, what we call progression-free survival, um, comparing the two groups of patients, um, early drop versus no drop uh, in their CTDNA. So, Finishing on with the metastatic disease, I now want to move on to early stage um, colorectal cancer and what the potential clinical applications are and that, that really um, focus on the work that we've done so far. So in the early stage disease, the potential utility could include detecting minimal residual disease as a prognostic marker after surgery. And for patients who under, un, is undergoing chemotherapy, uh, to monitor uh, in real time the chemotherapy effectiveness. And then when they go into the surveillance phase, um, it could be used to detect a recurrence earlier than routine imaging or CEA. And all these application has potential um, implication in terms of how we manage the patient. So detecting residual disease early could guide adjuvant treatment decision and the ability to monitor chemotherapy in real time could perhaps guide us to switch the treatment to a different type of treatment or potentially more effective treatment if the CTDNA doesn't um, disappear with the first type of chemotherapy. And during surveillance, by detecting the metastasis earlier, potentially we could offer a patient um, metastatectomy, so the resection of the metastases, which may improve survival. So... The, the reason we started looking into um, second tumor DNA as a marker of MRD, minimal residual disease in colorectal cancer, was based on um, Bert Vogelstein's um, earlier work published in 2008 in Nature Medicine. So Frank Deal is now with Systemax Agnostic. He used to be a PhD student at Bert's lab who 
what they collected a serial sample of 18 patients who underwent um, surgery for their liver metastases as well as their primary tumor. And this is using beaming um, to assess the patient's mutant DNA. This one was a P53 mutation this patient had. As you see that initially, before surgery, the patient had abundance of mutant DNA in the circulation, 13.4%. But it dropped down to virtually zero, but not quite um, um, zero. Uh, still detectable day three post-op. And the ctDNA fraction gradually increased over time, um, about eight months post-op, where clinical recurrence was detected. So this uh, really catapulted and catalyzed our study that I'm about to um, discuss, which was published um, last year in Science Translational Medicine, where we're looking at the use of this technology or this test in stage two colon cancer patient. Now, the reason we pick stage two colon cancer patient is because the use of adjuvant chemotherapy in this disease and this cohort of patient is very controversial. And the, there's a great need for a better marker of recurrence. So for this study, we aim to look at the uh, use of circulating, circulating tumor DNA as a marker of minimal residual disease to predict recurrence, as well as a real-time marker of chemotherapy benefit. So as way of background, um, although the majority of patients with stage 2 colon cancer can be cured with surgery alone, there is still 1 in 5, 20% will recur during surveillance due to the presence of occult um, micrometastatic disease during, uh, at the time of surgery. So our current approach as oncologists is to offer chemotherapy to selected high-risk patients with high-risk pathological features, um, chemotherapy, but this approach has very limited um, a benefit up to only 5%, which means we're over-treating 95% of patients. Um, our following treatment patient will then follow up with regular CEA and CT scans. So the goal of our, our research and our management in this patient is really to try and improve our patient selection for adjuvant treatment and also to detect recurrences earlier in the hope of improving survival. So over the past decade or two, oncologists have tried to introduce new treatment in addition to the backbone of 5 u chemotherapy. So we started adding oxaliplatin. And the Mosaic study have shown, although there is significant benefit in the stage three setting, these are patients with no positive bowel cancer, of the addition of oxaliplatin, but in stage two disease, the benefit is very small and is non-significant. Um, there's an absolute benefit of 4% seen in this study, but it's not significant. Even if that becomes significant with recruiting more patients, that still means that we're over-treating 96% of patients with potentially more toxic treatment. Another strategy has been uh, to look at um, patient's tumor tissue to see whether we can better stratify this patient's risk of recurrence. There are now several gene recurrence, uh, gene expression-based uh, recurrence score out there. Although all of which have prognostic significance statistically, their hazard ratios are not um, very high. They, they're quite modest, um, ranging from 1.4 to 3.7 which is not really large enough in order um, for a for clinician to adopt into clinical practice to be used to guide adjuvant treatment decision. So shown here the um, oncotyped DX12 um, gene recurrence score and their latest data, which stratify patients into low risk, um, intermediate risk and high risk group, um, but only with a hazard ratio of two. So our traditional approach to assessing recurrence risk in stage two disease is to examine the patient's resected tumor tissue um, for features of high risk, um, uh, for high risk features such as T4 tumor, the presence of lymphovasculation uh, invasion or adequacy of lymph node sampling. Clinician then uses information to guide adjuvant treatment decision. An alternative approach would be to examine patient's peripheral blood taken after the primary tumor has been removed for the presence of circulating tumor DNA. The detection of circulating tumor DNA after surgery is a direct indication of the presence of um, residual micrometastatic disease, much like how we would use CT scan to detect um, macroscopic um, cancer. So we... We completed enrollment 
um, of a large 250 patient multi-center study of stage two colon cancer patient. 231 eligible patients' tumor tissue were sequenced looking for a mutation in, um, in 15 genes that's recurrently mutated in bowel cancer. Peripheral blood was taken post-op at four to 10 weeks and then serially in a subgroup of patients, three monthly for up to two years, looking for a mutation that was found in the patient's primary tumor. Um, and at the use of adjuvant chemotherapy in the study was based on clinician's discretion, blinded to the ctDNA results. 23% um, of patients had adjuvant chemotherapy, and all patients underwent um, regular surveillance follow-up with six-monthly CT for two years and three-monthly review and CEA. At last follow-up, 15% patient had recurred. So the primary objective of that study was to demonstrate the presence of circulating tumor DNA post-surgery is the marker of uh, minimal residual disease. And we also wanted to explore the changes in ctDNA status during adjuvant chemotherapy for those who received them and, and also these changes during follow-up. So the primary endpoint was, was recurrence-free survival. We also wanted to es estimate the, predict, um, the pred predictive accuracy of post-op ctDNA um, in this cohort of patients. So shown here are the patient and tumor characteristics. You can see that age and sex are equally matched between the two groups. Uh, there's a trend towards an association between high-risk features and the presence of post-op ctDNA, um, but these did not reach statistical um, significance. Um, shown here, I just want to really highlight the muta muta mutant allele fraction of patients with positive ctDNA. I can see that they, most of them are less than 1%, some of them are even less than 0.01%, which is in contrast to the 16% of mutant allele fraction that we see in metastatic disease, highlighting the fact that you do need a very sensitive technology um, in the setting of detecting MRD. So we assess the prognostic significance of post-op ctDNA by looking at recurrence-free survival in patients not treated with chemotherapy. At a medium follow-up of just over two years, um, majority of patients, 11 out of 14, who had a positive test after surgery had experienced recurrence, while less than 10% of those with negative tests had experienced recurrence, with a predicted three-year recurrence we survived 90% for those with negative tests and 0% for those with the positive test and hazard ratio of 18. We then asked the question, does post-op ctDNA add to our standard clinical risk assessment using pathological features? And we found that the difference between ctDNA positive and ctDNA negative patients remain highly significant in the clinical low-risk and the clinical high-risk patients, with the low-risk group defined as those with mismatch repair deficient tumor or, or lack of poor prognostic features. And of particular relevance clinically, ctDNA identified those at high risk of recurrence among the clinical low-risk group who would typically not be offered adjuvant chemotherapy. We confirmed the prognostic significance of high-risk pathological features, um, including T-stage lymph node yield and lymphovascular invasion. But after multivariate analysis, only T-stage and post-op ctDNA remain independently associated with recurrence-free survival with a hazard ratio for ctDNA being 28. We then estimated the predictive accuracy of ctDNA for recurrence at three years, shown here as positive predictive value and negative predictive value. If the ctDNA is positive, the probability of having a residual disease and recurrence at three years is 100%. For patients with negative ctDNA, the probability of being recurrence-free at three years is 91%. So one of the potential advantage of a marker of MRD is the ability to track changes in tumor burden over time at a microscopic level below the detection threshold of routine imaging. For those treated with adjuvant chemotherapy, changes in ctDNA may reflect the imp impact of treatment. Mm -hmm. So potential scenarios include those with minimal or no response to treatment where the initial positive ctDNA remain positive or detectable at the end of chemotherapy and continues to rise during surveillance. As opposed to those with durable response 
where the positive ctDNA became negative and remained negative during surveillance. So shown here are examples of serial ctDNA levels from our study patients with positive post-op ctDNA who then received adjuvant chemotherapy. These two patients' ctDNA turned from positive to negative after chemotherapy and stayed negative during surveillance and both patients remained recurrence-free at their last follow-up. In contrast, these two patients' ctDNA remained positive at the completion of adjuvant chemotherapy and continued to rise during surveillance up to the time of clinical recurrence. Now, in a separate study, we, we examined 37 patients with resected colorectal liver metastases, the potential utility of serial ctDNA as a marker of chemo, uh, chemotherapy benefit was also um, observed. So patient with durable negative ctDNA um, following chemotherapy remained recurrence-free, while those with persistently positive ctDNA at the completion of chemotherapy experienced disease relapse. Likewise, the prognostic significance of ctDNA at the end of all treatment was also demonstrated in this resected um, liver metastasis cohort. So at the median follow-up of 27 months, all 10 patients with positive ctDNA at the end of their treatment experienced recurrence, while only four of the 27 patients with negative ctDNA had recurred with a hazard ratio of 13. So during follow-up, ctDNA was detectable um, in 85% of patients up to time of recurrence in stage 2 cohort and 92% of patients in the resected liver metastasis cohort with a lead time of ctDNA detection between, um, uh, compared to radiological recurrence of 5.5 months in the stage 2 cohort and 3 months in the liver metastasis cohort. So... Finally, I think the application of circling tumor DNA analysis that could have the largest impact on patient survival is in cancer screening. Now, this hasn't been the focus of our program so far, so I'm not really going to discuss, but really just to mention that GRAIL is a new biotechnology spin-off from Illumina that was established in 2016, and their mission is to develop a pan-tumor uh, pan cancer screening test in the blood based on circling tumor DNA over the next three years. Um, and it's heavily funded. They currently have US $100 million funding backed by the likes of um, Bill Gates and Amazon, so watch the space. Um, so finally, uh, there is no doubt there has been significant um, progress and considerable enthusiasm um, in this field of ctDNA. Uh, trying to, to move it towards clinical impl uh, implementation. Um, it provides, this test provides a non-invasive access to genomic changes. It provides information about prognosis, about treatment, response about the disease burden, and has potential implication in metastatic disease as well as early stage disease. Um, the technology currently is good, but there is still room for improvement, and we'll likely see more improvement in the platform, the assay, over the years to come. However, ultimately, we want to bring this into the clinic, and really the only uh, definitive way of proving the utility of second tumor DNA is to perform randomized clinical trial, uh, demonstrating the use of this test compared to uh, standard of care would improve patient outcome. So moving forward based on these very promising results that we've seen in the stage two cohort, we have in, uh, recently initiated a circulating tumor DNA-driven randomized adjuvant study in stage two colon cancer called the Dynamic Study, which is funded through NHMRC. Um, very briefly, the study will, will recruit 450 patients from Australia and Singapore, and patients will be randomized in a two-to-one ratio to either where their adjuvant chemotherapy decision will be based on post-op ctDNA status, i.e. you get chemotherapy only if you have a positive test and no chemotherapy if you have a negative test, compared to a third of patients who will be managed just based on their clinician's discretion, based on their clinical uh, risk features, the standard management group. So with that, I'll um, like to... And I'd like to thank um, all the Australian Participation Hospital, the patients, and um, the lab laboratory at Johns Hopkins, um, led by Bert Vogelstein. 
And lastly, my team in the Gibbs lab, who, who without whom these, uh, pro this program would not be possible. Thank you. Sorry. Um, it looks to me as though patients that progressed had more circulating tumor DNA. Um, and so to me, that would um, mean that it might not necessarily be cells that have been killed and releasing DNA. Maybe it's showing cells that are actually metastatic. So are you able to determine between shorter lengths of DNA and full length sort of DNA segments that might suggest whether it's from a dead cell or dying cell whether you're actually picking up metastatic cells in the circulation. This is in the metastatic setting? Are you you're referring okay, to the met... Because my saying might be that not all cells that sort of go into the circulation will always cause metastasis. So are you able to pick up between segments of DNA from a dead or dying tumour cell over cells that might be sort of circulating? So in theory... Um... <coughs> In theory, about four, at about you know four to ten weeks post, we should not have any circulating tumor DNA left behind after surgery. This is in the, in the early stage disease, so any detectable um, CT DNA would would really be an indication of uh, residual disease left behind. Um, so the fragments of DNA is very short in 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 the circulation that's from the tumor. Around about, I think at the moment the amplicon size is about 80 to 100 fragments. So I'm not sure whether we could tell by the length of the CT DNA where they're coming from. Um, I'm, I'm as a person very interested in where exosomes, the microvesicle, is going to take us the next step. You know, we don't know whether the CT DNA is actually coming from exosomes or just cell free floating around. Maybe that, that might add more information as to where the selfie DNA is coming from. One question, it's a little bit like that. Just wondering how reproducible these tests are. Are they absolutely consistent? That if a person has a certain pattern of mutations, that it's always that pattern of mutations, which then may evolve. And my second question is, do you see patterns in the development of these mutations? That if there's one mutation, that in time a series of other mutations will evolve. You just talked about numbers and the clinical correlation, but I wonder if there were patterns in which uh, you know genes are affected, and whether there's a clinical correlation. In it. Um, so we we only examine the driver mutations, the core mutations, which which. Um, usually doesn't disappear with, with treatment selection. For example, P53, APC, they should be present throughout the patient's clinical course. Um, but is the assay consistent? Does it always pick up the same pattern? I'm just wondering about the accuracy of the method. Is it method? So the, I believe Bert Vogelstein's looked at the correlation between, so he's looked at individual patient, for example, they may have three different mutations in the tumor, KRAS, PPPAP3, and then he examined all three in the blood, they seem to correlate really well. So, so he's, and that was one of the questions is if you look at multiple mutations in the blood in the same patient, could you increase sensitivity? Um, he's done that, he doesn't believe that they, they will change the sensitivity. Um, so I, I don't believe the pattern, I think you, you only need to look at one, one mutation. Um, and that will be sufficient to tell us whether there's residual disease or not. Yeah. And Jean, for your um, false and um, negatives, so you think um, the tumors are shedding a little less, or do you think there's something that the technology could be improving? Do you think must so, be things just more blood draws? Yeah, so, so, so sensitivity for detecting MRD is only 50% at the post-op time point. It does increase as time goes by. So up to 85% if you were, you know, collect serial sample until the time of recurrence. So the question really is, uh, have we reached our limit in terms of sensitivity using this technology? Um, or is there just no mutant DNA in those patients? They're just not releasing, or we're not getting enough. We take about 60 mils of blood. So it's pretty much limit, 
to the limit that you know, a lot of patients do complain about the amount of, as the team will know, amount of blood that we take. So there's a lot of blood um, of a patient serially. So I think, I don't think we can improve with volume of, of blood. We may improve on um, the technology. We may have to combine CTDNA with other proteinomics, methylation, to improve the sensitivity. Um, not entirely sure. Work in progress. We're looking into that. But yes, the sensitivity is, is not perfect, certainly. Um, potentially mucinous tumour, less likely to produce um, CTDNA. Um, working with Ryan and, and Michael Christie, looking at inflammation, whether inflammation may also play a role um, in whether patients who are, you know, the theory is whether a patient with a lot of inflammation may have less, less likely to release second tumour DNA, we're not sure. So potentially the location of metastases, um, just from a small number of patients, I found that local recurrences, which we have captured, yeah, will count as a recurrence, local recurrence in, a, in the pelvis, in an anastomotic area, has a lower rate of CTDNA detection in the blood. Small volume disease in the lung also tend to have a lower um, detection rate at recurrence. Um, liver tend to have a higher rate, so it may all depend on several factors. Maybe I missed out. So just a uh, question about this you are following the detection of certain CTDNA as pulse off, right, for the period. And we know that the CTDNA degrade after you, that they degrade in the last break naturally. So how we actually tell the, the difference in the presence of, of the of DNA or absence of DNA, whether they are just being degraded naturally or the basic timing. So, so, yeah, so we spin the plasma down ideally within two hours, but we allow up to three hours. Um, so we spin the plasma, or process them, sorry, process the blood into plasma within three hours of collection to minimise the degradation. Um, and we've also done some study with strict tubes, and that seems to be consistent. So I don't think, I don't think that degradation is, is a, a particular problem in the sensitivity. After treatment, for example, after three days. Or chemo. How you assess the absence of the DNA is not Yeah, so that's so one of the problem with uh, taking serial samples during treatment um, is is potentially you actually get release a lot of wild type DNA from bone marrow. Just that's how just how cytotoxic chemotherapy work and reduce the sensitivity of CTDNA detection. So we tend to collect the um, blood at least two weeks after their chemotherapy in between cycles. Does that answer your question? Um. <laughs> so you, you wouldn't want to um, collect your blood sample two or three days after chemotherapy, put it that way, because it could degrade everything. So we, we, we let the cell regenerate, and then we collect them usually in between cycles. We know that for bowel cancer, um, the reason we do... So chemotherapy, we don't give chemotherapy every day. They get given in what we call cycles, either two-weekly or three-weekly. And that is the time frame where we, we know that their cells have recovered because we look at their blood counts and things. So, so we take them just prior to the next cycle of chemotherapy. Yeah. with um, some hematological malignancies that you could have small amounts of minimal residual disease and the patient could actually still be cured, that they would, their own body would kill those cells if the numbers were small enough. So maybe that's wrong now or this is a different disease. <coughs> Do you think you're all not down to that limit yet where you can have low levels of disease that the yeah. is able to cope yeah. So that's a very good question. Um, does the immune system just get rid of it? Um, I think for majority cases, no. We do have, from our series, there is um, three patients that's false positive, so-called, so they have positive tests that haven't recurred. The question really with this patient at the time, either their follow-up's too short, they may recur over time, or whether they actually have cleared those CTDNA themselves. We don't know, but it's only a small proportion.
which I can't see. Um, so, so the first question was local current versus distant, distant currents. Our numbers are not large enough for us to dissect it down um, to the subgroup, but my feeling is, yes, the distant recurrence are probably more likely to be picked up by CTDNA versus local recurrence. We do have a few local recurrence where we have positive, but proportionally is less. Um, but numbers are too small to, to read too much into it. We're hoping that with the dynamic study, we have more numbers where we're able to give uh, a more definitive answer. Um, and the second question is the tumor heterogeneity. Look, I don't, we, well, that's the reason we look at driver mutation. If you start looking at other passenger mutation, I don't really know what's going to happen to them. So for monitoring disease, I think using driver mutation is very safe. If you started looking at targeted therapy in the metastatic setting, for example, then you really have to go a bit wider and do whole exome sequencing, for example, if you're looking at resistant mutation. Uh, 